Good evening. My name is Wayne Nafziger, and I'd like to welcome you to this fourth and final Lou Douglas lecture of the 1988 season. These lectures were begun to honor the memory of Lewis Douglas, who was a professor of political science and a supporter of uh, University for Man from its beginning. Sponsors of this series include the University for Man, the Office of the Provost, the Student Governing Association, the Division of Continuing Education, the Department of Political Science, the Pre-Law Club, <coughs> Ecumenical Christian Ministries, and there are several other organizations, individuals, and so forth who are listed in your program. I want to point out that after tonight's lecture, there will be a reception that's hosted by the Manhattan Chapter of Women in Communication, and it's at the home of Beverly Miller at 117 North 14th Street, which is one block north of Points, across from the city park. And I would like to uh, now acknowledge Mary Douglas, the widow of Lou Douglas. Provost Jim Kaufman, who is the Chief Academic Officer of Kansas State University, will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Wayne. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce Barbara Ehrenreich to you this evening and to welcome her to Manhattan, Kansas, which I understand is your first time in these immediate parts. And we were remarking earlier that, that uh, the weather usually is this way this time of year. And you can go away and carry that impression back to New York. <laughs> we also took note of the fact that having earned a BA from Reed College and subsequently a PhD in biology from the Rockefeller University, that you don't always know when you obtain your degree what you wind up doing later in life. And therefore, a broad background and a broad perspective has substantial value as evidenced by this evening's speaker who with that academic background has gained eminence in a variety of areas that are represented by her very successful career as a writer. Following the uh, receipt of her PhD in biology from Rockefeller University, she developed an interest in medical policy. And from that, without a formal background in creative writing per se, has gained eminence in a, a number of areas as evidenced by her very impressive track record. Ms. Ehrenreich is the author of The Hearts of Man, American Dreams, and the Flight from Commitment, and uh, co-author of For Her Own Good, 150 Years of the Expert's Advice to Women. She has published numerous books in a similar vein and is now working on a book tentatively titled The Liberal Surrender on American Political Culture from the 1960s through the 1980s. She has written articles that have appeared in a wide range of publications, including the New York Times Magazine, Esquire, The Atlantic Monthly, The Nation, The New Republic, Social Policy, Vogue, TV Guide, The Wall Street Journal. She has written the HERS column for the New York Times and writes regular columns for Ms. and Mother Jones. And I would say that that is a not only eminent background, but eminently diverse background. And it certainly impresses me. She is currently a fellow at the, at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., where she is completing a study on women in the economy and is a fellow of the New York Institute for the Humanities at New York University. She was awarded a Ford Foundation Award for Humanistic Perspectives on Contemporary Society in 1982 and shared the National Magazine Award for Excellence in Reporting in 1980. She is widely known as a public speaker on women's issues and is a frequent radio and television talk show guest. 
She's lectured at over 100 colleges and universities in the United States, Canada, England, and Holland, and has appeared on dozens of shows, including the Today Show, Good Morning America, ABC Nightline, and the Mike Douglas Show. It is our pleasure indeed to uh, take advantage of Miss Ehrenreich's presence with us this evening. Please welcome her to Kansas State University. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Jim. I'm especially thank you for not coming right out and saying I'm a dilettante, but uh, I considered that quite generous of you. I want to say that it is, it is, I feel genuinely glad to be here and out of New York. I suppose you call it the other apple or the ostentatiously overgrown apple or something. I don't know how you look at it. Uh, but because the last few days in New York were really pretty nasty, uh, we had Mayor Koch running for president. Um, <laughs> apparently against Yasser Arafat. Um, <laughs> at, at this point, many of us would, uh, would take Yasser Arafat if that were a choice. Um, but all that he accomplished was to torpedo Al Gore. Um, the man who had no known position on any issue except possibly rock lyrics, and he got that one from his wife. Um, but I have to say, I am, I am disappointed. I was, I'm a Jackson supporter, and I understand this is a Jackson County, right? Um, I, I could tell when I got into the air, the, the air, everything, the, you know, the whole spirit was uh, kind of thing. But I, you know, my disappointment is partly just a, you know, a selfish thing. Can you imagine what a Bush-Jackson debate would be like on TV? I mean... <laughs> I mean, there's still hope. I mean, that, that would be the phenomenon. That would be really something to look forward to. Uh, it would have probably been the worst blow to the self-esteem of a certain kind of white folks since the Civil War. Um, as, my, as my feminist friends say, um, George Bush is, is interesting in one way. He is the man who resembles every woman's first husband. <laughs> Every woman here has a first husband. Huh? It's interesting. Well, uh, sometimes he is, I would say, though, he is sometimes treated unfairly. Um, people keep saying he's covering up his role in the Iran-Contra affair. I don't think that's true. Uh, he's covering up a severe ba uh, bladder problem. <laughs> How else could he have been out of the room, in a men's room, every single time an important illegal decision was made? So that's, I mean, it's, it's been an interesting campaign. Uh, I'm going to miss some of the candidates who fell away along the, you know, fell to the side along the way, like Pat Robertson, because, you know, he, he was, people laughed at him, but he was the man who needed the job more than anyone, um, because he had never had a job before. And, you know, he certainly wasn't going to go around and say, I'm a televangelist, uh, not after swagger, not, you know, nobody, nobody would want him to kiss their babies. Um, or Gebhardt, um, he was in, he's another interesting one. He was um, really, I think, the most glaring case of, of plagiarism was not Biden, it was Gebhardt. Uh, all of the candidates, the Democratic candidates at a certain point, tried to remake themselves to be more like Jesse Jackson. You know, that was the whole drift. Um, and Gebhardt went further than any of the others. He started talking about how the corporations merge with each other and purge the workers and that, that um, you know, the rest of it. Um, and then he soon was, began to talk about um, his youth growing up as a poor black boy in the South um, <laughs> and how he amazingly just turned white all the way up to and including his eyebrows. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's been so interesting. I hate to let, let any one of them go, you know, when it's been such a fascinating campaign season. Now, I want to talk about tonight is something that, unfortunately, the candidates have not been talking about, I think they should be talking about, and that is the growing class inequality in our society. And since this is the sixth month anniversary of the um, stock market crash, um, I want to start by just observing what has been the conventional wisdom among many of the economic commentators and pundits ever since the crash. 
Uh, and it goes like this. I'm sure you've heard it. This is from Pete Peterson, and you know you would read probably in in Newsweek commentaries and so on. Um, the post-crash wisdom has been, okay, we partied, we lived beyond our means, we went crazy, we have been a permissive society, a permit. We we're up well that you know permissive economy too. Now it's time to pay the piper, raise the taxes for the middle class cut social spending, we've got to cut the deficit, we have to have austerity programs and really squeeze the public sector. Because uh, that's what we have to do to calm the markets and stabilize the economy. Now, I think that approach is wrong, is misleading, um, and, and takes absolutely, absolutely does not recognize what has been happening in our society for some time now. Uh, some people may have partied, and I'll talk about who a little more, in the months before the crash. But it wasn't we, unless there's somebody in this room I don't know about. Because we, as a society, are very different than we were as a society, as a society uh, before the military coup. I mean, not the, the, not the military coup, the uh, election of 1980. Um, we have become very deeply divided along lines of class in addition to the other lines of race and gender that we are already divided by. And what I want to talk about tonight is how we have become divided, a few facts, what it means for our society, particularly for the middle class. I don't really want to talk about the extreme so much. I want to talk about that middle that is being scrunched and maybe disappearing. And then I want to return to the economic question, the, what the qu question the economists are raising is, well, where where are we going? How do we get out of this if this is happening? Um, so what, what has been happening is what the economists call class polarization. Sometimes they say disappearing middle class to describe it. And what it means briefly is that the extremes in our society have been getting further apart. The middle is shrinking numerically so that we are heading toward becoming a two-tier society of the wealthy, and there won't be that many of them, and the poor, and there'll be with a lot of us. In fact, uh, some, you know, this, this is a pattern roughly like the pattern in many third world societies. In fact, some, psych, uh, uh, some economists call this the Brazilianization of America, what is happening. Maybe that's unfair to, the, to Brazil, who may think that they are undergoing the Americanization of Brazil, but the drift is we are converging toward a more third world-like pattern. Now, at first, when the news began to come out from congressional studies, from, um, from the con Congressional Budget Office, uh, from census data, at first there was a tremendous resistance to believing that this could be happening. After all, this isn't the nation that has lived, you know, enjoyed the myth of having a universal middle class that we were all supposed to be in. When I um, wrote an article in the New York Times Magazine about this phenomenon, a year ago, I was instantly attacked by various right-wing intellectuals in Washington. Actually, that's sort of an oxymoron, right-wing <laughs> intellectual. Um, one of those little contradictions like um, Philadelphia nightlife. Um, and um, I wouldn't say anything about Manhattan <laughs> or um, um, Amtrak schedule. Actually, I should say Eastern Airlines schedule. Or my favorite from the, uh, the excuse me the Reagan years, which was protracted nuclear war, another oxymoron. But anyway, they jumped on this. They said this isn't true. This is a, you know this is another uh, chicken little leftist was their remark. But the evidence keeps piling up. In fact, I was very gratified a few weeks after my article in, in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal had an almost identical article. I'm not really pleased. They had a few changes in the sentences and all. So I like to give their statistics just so that nobody would think that these are distorted by any desire to make things worse than they are. And I do want to give you just a few numbers very quickly. So those of you who have papers out can write something down. And to show you that they're these are real changes. Um, first, on the distribution of income, uh, the you can see this is not something that changes a lot. I mean, there, these are not fluctuations we're looking at. Income distribution in any society is something that tends to change only slowly. Well, it's been changing rapidly here. At this point in America, the top one-fifth of all families, top one-fifth in terms of 
income, takes in 43% of all family income, and that is the highest share that they have gotten since the end, since post-World War II era, era, when these statistics were first collected. Meanwhile, the bottom one-fifth of Americans, the poorest, gets only 4% of all family income. So we have 20% raking in 40% and another 20% that gets in only 4%. The middle, there's also a change if you define the middle uh, in one rough, one rough measure, the middle now gets 39% of all family income, which is down from 46% in 1970. And that may not seem like a big difference, but as I said, these things change slowly. That is a big difference. That is not a fluctuation to, to ignore. Wealth is, of course, far more unequally distributed than income. 1% of the population owns over 33% of total wealth in this country compared to the 27% uh, that top 1% had in 1974. And if you look at it another way, you can see that the numbers of people in each group, the poor, the, the, middle, the middle, the upper class, however we divide it, the number of people in poverty has gone up uh, since 1970. The number of wealthy people has also gone up since 1970. Um, to, a, to now be 18% of the population, earning over $50,000 a year. And the middle is shrinking, and I'll give you this number. Um, in 1970, 46% of American families fit into what economists defined as the middle range of family income. Now it is only 38% of American families that fit into that middle range. Now, what, just away from the numbers for a minute, what, what does it look like as a society begins to polarize like this? And I just want to give you a few, a few concrete images. Probably this polarization, this disappearance of the middle class is most visible in some of the big cities. You cannot ignore it in Los Angeles. You cannot ignore it in New York. Um, you, you just see the extremes of wealth, as I'm sure you've heard in the other Manhattan, you know, from those pr people whose problems is how to manage their several homes to those, of course, who are homeless in growing numbers and increasingly families uh, with children. I had a French family visiting um, my family recently. They were appalled. Um, they were, what they saw, what they found in, the subway st in a subway station near where they were staying in Manhattan, uh, in a very wealthy area of New York City, was that at nighttime, um, people were sleeping in it in neat little rows, you know, that spread out um, papers and things to sleep on, exactly as if it were a sort of well-organized um, living place they had created for themselves. That people have, a, I can't say adapted to homelessness, I don't think anybody can adapt to that for good, but that it is so common that people ha find a way, they'll sleep in the subways, they'll sleep in tunnels, and so on. People will ask you on the street not only for money, and that happens every few yards, they'll ask you also for food if you're carrying some in your hand. Now, this is not something I had ever in my life seen in America, but only in the third world. Another striking image of the change comes really from the area of retail marketing. Uh, some years ago, before any of the talk about the disappearing middle class, a study in Fortune magazine began to notice an interesting change in retail marketing patterns in America. What he wrote about is that the middle class stores, those stores that aim right for the middle, and I'm not sure exactly what they are here, but in the East that meant Gimbel's, Corvettes, Orbach's, uh, some others, have closed. They're gone. Um, the, one, the stores that are doing very well are those that concentrate on the very rich, which would be uh, things like Bloomingdale's and Neiman Marcus in some areas. And the also doing very well are those that have decided to co um, concentrate on, the, on those who are at the bottom or near the bottom, uh, discount stores like Kmart. Pennies and Sears are an interest in an interesting little situation there. They're trying to figure out whether to go up or down. I think it'll be very interesting to see pennies try to become more like Bloomingdale's, but you know, you can try that. But you can see, in retailing, we don't have a middle anymore, or we have less and less of a middle. It's been falling out. 
Um, so why is this happening? Why are we, be, why are we moving toward being a two-tier society? Well, I want, I want to quickly give four big reasons before talking about what we might do about it. And the first is that in the last few years, certain groups were simply set adrift. Uh, they left the middle class, uh, not, uh, not voluntarily, and sank toward poverty or deeper into poverty. Farmers in large numbers is one group. Obviously, that lost people, many of them sank uh, into, to, out of the middle class. Industrial workers, another category. Between the late 70s and the mid-1980s, this nation lost 11 million blue-collar jobs, manufacturing, transportation, and so on. Now, that doesn't mean 11 million people all of at once were unemployed, but that means that many people went through one job after another and got bounced out of relatively high-paying, unionized, blue-collar jobs into much more low-paying jobs, about two-thirds of men who had been employed in decent paying or relatively decent paying industrial jobs have ended up in much lower paying jobs. One way of leaving the middle class. Then, of course, single mothers and their families. You have all heard of the feminization of poverty, and I know there was a, a panel on that subject just recently here. Single mothers and their families have not done well uh, in the last few years. First, just being a single mother, perhaps also a single father in many cases, is enough to catapult somebody out of the middle class altogether. I would just mention uh, one of the most fascinating statistics to come out of feminist research in the last few years from Lenore Weitzman, uh, who is now at Harvard. She studied what happens to people after their divorce. She followed the ex-husband, the ex-wife, and found that as she expected, see, children almost always end up with the ex-wife. She found that the ex-wife saw her income decline after divorce by 70 percent when six months was up. That's a, bit, that's a lot. That's because the male support is so much less. Child support, very low, alimony non-existent. She saw that for the ex-husband, however, after divorce, that his income, on the average, actually rose by 43%. So that this was an average, and what it meant is that in many cases, divorce in our society splits people right away, and one person goes from the middle class down, one goes slightly up. Um, but the, for many reasons, uh, cutbacks in, in welfare, cutbacks in other supports for poor women, the condition of single mothers and their children in this country has worsened and worsened. Uh, at one point, one of my um, sociologist friends was predicting that if these trends went on, by 1990, the entire poverty population would be composed of women, white and black, and their children. Um, however, um, uh, there's no danger of that. Men have been coming into poverty too, fortunately, to even it out, you could say the one successful affirmative action program of the Reagan administration <laughs> was to get some men, some white men, into poverty too, uh, so we women wouldn't have just that all to ourselves. So these groups certainly did not spend the last 10 or five years partying or splurging. Um, the, this is part of what's been happening. But to go on to another reason for why we're become pol becoming polarized as a society, we have had public policies under the Reagan administration which encouraged, which promoted class polarization. Reagan came along and did something very radical. He re redistributed the wealth from down to up. That was the theme for many years. For example, the, with the 1981 tax cuts, which were tax cuts for the very wealthy. Combining those tax cuts with the effect of the cuts he also made in social programs for the poor, food stamps, Medicaid, housing subsidies, and so on, between 1980 and 1984, the richest one-fifth of American families gained $25 billion in, in fresh income, 
while the poorest one-fifth lost six billion dollars just from the same thing. Now that is a big redistribution of income. By the way, the 1986 tax reform does not help, does not correct that, and is a step back still further from a progressive system of taxation. Because all it did, when you get beyond the loophole closing and those relatively minor details, is it lowered the maximum tax rate for the rich so that we are no longer have a truly progressive system of taxation. But for my third reason why this is happening, and this is perhaps the deepest reason, and this is something that you it begins before 1980. It goes deeper. And this is that we have been becoming a low-wage economy. Now, some of the presidential candidates have talked about that, have brought that issue out. Wages have been stagnating or actually falling for most workers, except those at the top uh, throughout the 80s. Uh, just a few more numbers. Between 1978 and 1984, almost one half of all new jobs paid near poverty level wages. Now that is an economy heading to become a low wage economy. I mean, that's what we're on to. We are losing the 10 and 15 and $20 an hour jobs and gaining the four and six and seven dollar an hour jobs. Um, in 1985, 32 percent of American jobs paid below the poverty level for a family of four. And the poverty level for a family of four is about $11,000. We have 18 million Americans working full time at wages that do not lift them up out of the poverty level. And that poverty level, let me just say parenthetically, I don't like it. I think it's arbitrary. I think it doesn't reflect people's real needs. I think a poverty level of 11,000 a year for a family of four is probably a subsistence level when you think of current rents. <clears throat> so that all the predictions are that we will continue to go this way, continue to, lo to, to lose the relatively high paying jobs and gain the relatively low paying jobs. Now, I should just mention, in the same period in the 80s, in the, between the late 70s and the 80s, compensation for corporate uh, for chief executive officers of corporation rose by 181 percent. So, you know, no problem up there. Now, why this trend to low-wage jobs? Well, the conventional answer, which everybody will give you, is we're service economy now. That's what services cost. Well, I mean, we can't let that answer stand like that. First, it has to be observed that Many of the people traditionally occupying the lowest paying jobs in our society are minorities and or female. If those jobs are underpaid, it's often because those people's labor is under, underpaid. Nothing intrinsic about services that makes them low paid. But there's something else. Organized labor has been having a very difficult time holding its own in this country. Maybe part of the blame goes on organized labor itself. But some of the blame has to also go to the policies of the most anti-labor administration we have had um, probably, uh, probably since when, 1920s, 1930s? What we've seen, you know, the pattern has been workers not gaining in negotiations, but giving givebacks, uh, not holding on to existing wage levels, but actually losing ground. By the way, this, this pattern is so prominent in the airlines industry. It is one of, that's one thing that makes it so scary to travel by plane these days. You know those flight attendants just got knocked down by 25%. You wonder about the pilots, you know, you, are they moonlighting? Um, what else do they do for, for a living? Um, is this a part-time job for them? And so on. I mean, the, the airlines have just one of the highly visible occupations where this has gone on. But it has also gotten very hard for very ordinary, not very visible people, and not very glamorous occupations to do what Americans have traditionally done when they want to bootstrap up, and that is to organize themselves into a union. And I, I just would mention a few stories uh, from the front lines. My husband is a union organizer. And um, 
It has not been easy in these last eight years. The National Labor Relations Board virtually folded up, stopped providing any kind of backup to people faced with unfair labor practices. And I'll give you a couple, uh, uh, just a couple of examples, because sometimes we think of the dramatic phase of labor history having been in the coal fields in the 1920s or the, 19, or the teens, not so. Uh, one of the companies that my um, husband attempted to organize was a candy wrapping factory in, the, in Queens, in the city of New York. The employees were young Hispanic men, paid three, uh, you know, just above the minimum wage, just over 335 an hour. A few of them got interested enough and were brave enough to want to form a committee to unionize. Uh, the boss found out which two of these young men were in the leadership of that committee and pistol whipped them in full view of all the other employees in the factory. That dampens enthusiasm for the union. Uh, in numerous occasions, um, recently, just where I live, and I'm collecting, if you know of other cases, you should tell me because I want to write an article about this, organizers or workers who are prominent in organizing drives have been beaten up. Um, two or three cases just recently in the New York, in the New York era, area. Beaten up in classic fashion by thugs, company thugs. <clears throat> now these things are not just rude, they're illegal. You know, you can't beat, we're not supposed to pistol whip people. It's against the law to discourage people from joining unions in those fashions. But as I said, we had an administration that did not back up labor at all with the force of law and let those who have superior power, whether that gun comes from guns and force or simply the power to hire and fire, uh, trample on the rights of ordinary people and often very poor people uh, earning near the minimum wage. So it has been very hard for people to lift themselves up, as I said, in that classic American way. Now, one more factor I want to mention that is polarizing our society, pushing us toward becoming possibly a two-tier society. And that is, disturbingly, class polarization itself. In other words, there is a feedback effect, uh, a positive feedback effect. The more we polarize, the more difficult it is to reverse that trend. We start down a, we have started down a very dangerous path. It has its own momentum. For one thing, the affluent, say, which, which we could just say are roughly the upper one-fifth or those who have family incomes above 48,000 a year, it doesn't sound, it's sort of surprising to think that is the upper fifth, but because that may not sound all that high. They're, they, in a polarizing society, and you can see this in the cities, you will see it increasingly in other parts of the country, they start doing whatever they can to avoid the people at the bottom. As they get further apart, those groups do not want to mix. So the affluent abandon public services like schools, public spaces like parks. And that is bad for those spaces and those services because when they lose the affluent, they lose powerful advocates for maintaining those public schools, those services, and so on. The affluent begin to retreat into good neighborhoods, so-called. They begin in, in our cities. You can see them developing a fortress mentality, that you have certain areas that are safe. Why do they have to be safe? Because there are so many people who are hungry, desperate, or who are addicted out of hope, the hopelessness of their lives, addicted and, and willing to steal for their drug. So we have fort fortresses virtually, communities that you can't enter. And as those people, the more affluent, pull away from a general kind of community involvement, they lose interest in supporting the, the public sector as a whole. I mean, think about it. If you could send your children to a private school, if you could take all your vacations in Aspen or somewhere like that, if you could commute entirely by limousine, you would have no interest in paying more taxes to support a public sector with public transportation and education, health care, and so on. 
And that is part of the story of what happened in the 80s. There weren't any more limousine liberals, which is what Spiro Agnew, some of you will remember, used to call all liberals, limousine liberals, or effete snobs who happened to be liberals. Increasingly, those with money became Republicans. And, um, and in fact, today, you know, there are people can be any political persuasion, no matter what their income. I wouldn't be an economic determinist about this. But at this point, in the very upper reaches of American society, uh, liberals are about as hard to find as it is to find Republicans on the welfare rolls. We have become a, polar, a politically polarized as well as economically class polarized society. Now, I've talked about a little bit about why it seems to have happened. And I want now just want to pause and consider for a moment what is happening in the middle, in that disappearing middle, that shrinking middle. What is life like for those who are left in the middle? The people who get by on a median income of 28 to 29 thousand dollars a year, because that is the median income in the United States today for a family of four, not for an individual. For an individual, it's much lower. But for a family of four, $29,000 a year. Now, that's a lot. That's way above the poverty level, $18,000 a year above the poverty level. But it is not enough to live very well on. Now, let me just, just one little technical footnote here. It used to be that the federal government published annually uh, some very useful statistics on how much you needed to live in these sort of three different levels. They'd say, for a modest level, you need to make X number for, uh, a year for your family of four. For a comfortable level, you know, they had the three levels. So you could compare your income or the median income or whatever to those levels, to those things uh, that the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics published. Well, uh, in the early 80s, the Reagan administration decided that that kind of information was too incendiary, so we can no longer find that out. We can't find out what is a decent amount of money you need to live on in the middle class lifestyle today. That, that information is no longer produced, or if it is, it's no longer given out. But you can make some guesses. If you have the median income, 29000 a year for your family, you will probably not be able to buy a house because the National Home Builders Association now says you've got to have at least 40000 a year to buy a house. You may have trouble putting your kids through college, particularly through a co uh, private college uh, with tuitions now up uh, close to $20,000 a year. That would be out of reach. Now, I emphasize those things, home ownership and college tuition, because those things are practically the definition of a middle-class lifestyle. And the point here is that you can be right in the middle of our society economically, and that's what the median income is, the very middle, but you can't afford a middle-class lifestyle on that. And that is very serious. When the median income no longer buys you what people would expect as part of the middle-class package, what we grew up expecting we would have. A home of our own, perhaps, children going to college, vacations, two cars, whatever. For younger couples, that is increasingly not a possibility. And by the way, one argument, one conservative argument has been, well, that's not so bad. You know, we're talking about a baby boom, a lot of young people. Wait till they're older, they'll catch them, they'll do well too. Well, there's a very depressing study by um, Frank Levy and Richard Michael, two economists in Washington, that shows that people's incomes are now actually declining in middle age rather than going up. What they looked at was men between the age of 40 and the age of 50. In the 1950s, that was a year, in a, a decade in a man's life when he could expect to improve. That is now a decade in the average man's life coming up to that age where he can expect to see his earnings actually decline. Uh, so there is, is not much hope just from the natural process of getting older. How do people hold on in the middle class? Well, you know, I'm very sure you all think about that too, but 
Two incomes are not an option. That is no longer an option for most people in the middle class. And very often that median $29,000 a year is made up of a male income of, say, $18,000 a year and a female income of, say, a ten or $11,000 a year. And by the way, I mean, that, that is the ultimate, the, the ultimate answer to Phyllis Schlafly if she is still asking the question. Um, is that, you know, why don't we all go back to the home? You know, why don't we women go back to the home and do what we should, you know, to care for our children and bake bread and things? It's not that we are all so unutterably opposed to doing that or that feminists hate housework so much or anything like that. It is that there is just not an economic option, not an economic alternative anymore. And I think it's taken the, the far right, the anti-feminist far right, a long time to catch up to that reality of life, is that women are in the workforce to stay because there is just simply no way that the middle class will survive at all. Other ways that people get by that, uh, that we see, I see anyway, uh, in the suburbs of New York and in the East, mul the multi-generational household, that the young couple doesn't buy a house, a uh, baby buys a trailer, more often uh, lives in the basement of the parents' house so that three generations are living together. Interestingly enough, in Levittown, which was the classic suburb, you know, where all suburbs all began, that was the pattern, the ideal place where every family would have its own ticky-tacky, but, you know, nice little house for themselves. A recent survey found that one-third of the houses in Levittown today are occupied by people not related or not in nuclear families, people taking in borders and the three-generational kind of uh, situation, which is forced on so many young people and old people, too. So it, I think this is a little bit of what is happening in the middle. And I think part of the tragedy of the middle and those below the middle economically today is that we even while so many people have slipped downwards economically, that we still have a culture which is dominated by images of very, very wealthy people. That if you turn on television or you flip through a magazine, well, it depends which magazine, of course, but you are likely to see, if not you know, actual plutocrats, at least very well-heeled young yuppies sipping cognac in their ski, um, ski cottages and um, what else do they do? Um, exercising in their $50 leotards and, and so on. You know, that we, all of us, even the family living on food stamps, is barraged by these images of very upscale consumption that set a standard that very few of us can reach. And I think that that acts on our sense of, of self-esteem, if nothing else. We don't see an alternative, a dressed down alternative, whatever it would be like. We see these images, we see the lifestyles of the rich and famous and so on, and we say, what's the matter with me? And it's hard, you know, you can't just sort of will yourself out of that. If you have a 15-year-old son, as I do, you can't say, no, you can't have a $60 pair of sneakers, you're going to Kmart and getting them off the rack, because he couldn't walk into school like that. You know, I'm, I, that's not, this is a serious issue. Uh, he would tell me, no, I could not walk into school. I would have to go barefoot um, rather than that. But these pressures have not relented, and they are the same pressures, by the way, on the 15-year-old in the ghetto who may have absolutely no money uh, with which to dress in, the, in a socially acceptable way. So we are barraged with this pressure for a kind of lifestyle we cannot hope to um, achieve, most of us. So just to return to what I started by talking about, this, this dominant economic wisdom since the stock market meltdown, which has been, we partied, Americans went wild, we splurged, now we have to tighten our belts and go into austerity. Well, who partied? It certainly wasn't most of us. It certainly it wasn't this general we who partied. Let me just recall the purpose of the supply-side economics that pr produced some of this polarization through those tax cuts and everything. 
The idea of Reagan's supply side economics was that if you give the very rich and the corporate elite enough, soon they will get the idea of investing some of that in something that might be a benefit to the rest of us, such as you know, new plants, new technology, new manufacturing capability. Now, of course, when you're going to give the rich money, I think you have to give them more money than you would give to the poor because it takes a long time for them to even notice they're getting new money. So they get more and more and more and send it, send it up there. And then they waited for the trickle down. They waited and waited for the new plants to appear, for the new manufacturing capability, for the new R&D capability. Well, what happened? No investment in new manufacturing, no investment in new uh, plants, technology. In fact, Business Week, you know, as of two weeks ago, was reporting that it's still not happening. It's still not coming down. What did happen with that money that went up and up and up through Reaganomics was that binge of speculation that led to the stock market crash. That's where the money went. It went in, it did not go in productive investments. It went in speculative investments, mergers, leveraged buyouts, international currency speculation. It went to an enormous amount of gambling. Now, I think that there is a lesson from this little experiment we have had in the upward redistribution of wealth, Reagan's experiment. And the lesson should be clear now, and that is, that the rich can't be trusted with money. <laughs> and there is a cure for that. <laughs> so here we are six months later, st a, still a deeply polarized society, a society of the shrinking middle class, and a society with a shaky economy where we have to worry from week to week about whether those um, uh, markets will truly crash and uh, plunge us into recession or depression. Well, the last part of what I want to talk about briefly is, is there a way out? Or what should we be telling the Democrats uh, to do, to stand up for? And I would say, yes, there is an obvious way out. If the problem is it has been a redistribution of income that produced this terrible polarization of our society that's destroying the middle class, devastating the poor, then you have to redistribute the income the other way, which is down. And I used to think that it was very radical <clears throat> to talk that way, but when once Reagan redistributed the income, it became, I guess, OK to say it. In fact, now it's probably quite conservative. I want to go back the other way to where it used to be. What that would mean, and what I think a democratic platform should be, no matter who the candidate is, is that we have to have a return to progressive taxation in this country. Taxation should no longer be a mechanism for looting the middle class in order to finance the stretch limos of the rich. And that's what it's become. We have to, secondly, raise the minimum wage to make it easier for working people, all working people, to survive and support their children. Revive the National Labor Relations Board so people can organize as they are supposed to be allowed to in this country. And then we have to build up what I think we could call the social infrastructure of our society. And that means investing in people, health insurance, Finally, the candidates are talking about that. Jesse Jackson is running on program of national health insurance for everybody. Dukakis is catching up. He's learning. He's getting there. Um, 40 million Americans right now have no form of health insurance, which means many hospitals will not accept them even in an emergency. We have to have a program of universal and publicly subsidized child care for the middle class for everybody. Because that, <laughs> some children in the audience? Because <laughs> childcare, remember, is not just for parents, it's for children. Uh, the people who get the, you know, the, the short end of the stick now are children who are not being cared for. For example, the seven million American children between the ages of seven and 13 who always come home to a home with no one in it after school. 
child care that this cannot be postponed it's a responsibility of it's no longer a women's issues it's everybody's issue and we have to have either we have to have ways of prodding the private sector into it or ha and having the public sector take the lead on this jobs we have almost a full employment economy we need now jobs that pay enough for people to live on and support their families with Jesse Jackson and to a lesser extent uh, Dukakis have begun to talk about jobs programs. What will people do? It's easy. We have so much to do. Rebuilding the infrastructure, providing needed social services, providing home care for the elderly, providing literacy training. No shortage of things to do if someone is willing to pay people decently to get them done. And finally, part of what we need to build up is income supports. Not everybody at all times can work or can find work that pays enough. We need to return to a more adequate system of unemployment compensation. You know, that was virtually cut in half by the Reagan administration. And also, I would say the most stigmatized program, I will stand up for it, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad it's not stigmatized in Manhattan, Kansas, because, I mean, that, right now, there's a bill before the Senate which would be a major step to eliminating AFDC and replacing it with a coercive form of workfare. I am personally, as a feminist, very upset about that, because it assumes that women on welfare are lazy, aren't doing anything, and need to be put to work. Well, there's an old feminist slogan, every mother is a working mother. And those mothers who are raising children under the most difficult conditions of being single parents and being in poverty need our support, not our castigation and our condemnation, which is what they've been getting. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to do something about it, please write to a senator uh, and say that you are not happy with the Moynihan Welfare Reform Bill. Right, right away, really, it would help. Now, people always say, where would the money come from for these things? I think um, the answer, part of the answer has to be from a more progressive system of taxation. And, of course, part of the answer has to be from cutting the military. Again, Jesse Jackson has been campaigning for that. There's no way out of this. In fact, the, the, the worst tragedy, I think, of the past eight years has been the steady transfer of funds from the poor to the Pentagon. The cuts in social welfare programs and the corresponding buildup in the Pentagon at the rate of approximately $30 billion a year, going from programs to meet human needs to programs aimed only at destruction and ultimately death. So we've got, we've got to get money from there. Uh, if you wanted to say to me, well, why pick on rich people and giant corporations and generals? Why, you know, well, why this, is that unfair? I would give the same answer that the famous criminal Willie Sutton gave when he was asked why he robbed banks. And that is, he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> but I think the real question that we have to be putting, and we have to be putting to the politicians and everybody is, that the question can't be, how can we afford this or that? The question can be, is how can we not afford it? How can we continue to go down the path toward being a grossly unequal two-tier society? And I would add that we have to start thinking something even more radical in this society, and that is the need to redistribute not just wealth, but power and decision-making. Why should a few people who are CEOs and finance bankers and so on have virtually dictatorial control over our economy, making decisions that will affect hundreds of millions of people's lives, decisions about whether to close a plant down and leave a city as a ghost town, decisions about whether to carry American industries overseas or to keep them here, decisions about whether to invest productively anywhere or simply to gamble with the nation's wealth. We need economic empowerment. 
We need to start talking about economic democracy, extending our voices into those areas of decision making. And that means putting workers on some boards of directors of our corporations. It means having citizens have a voice in economic decisions that affect their community's welfare, including plant closings and things like that. It means consumers having something to say about the price we will, what is produced, the price we'll pay, and the standards of quality we want met, no matter what the area is. So I think that's going to be the next frontier in this country, is beginning to talk about economic empowerment as well as about redistribution. Now, we could, and I don't want to, get into a big debate about, well, is this economically feasible? Is that technically feasible? Would the, you know, and I know the conservatives could give you many reasons why everything I said is technically unfeasible. We can't do that. Have to keep sending the money up. Liberals could give many technical reasons why it will work. We should do this. But I think, I just think rather than answering or looking at those questions, there is a deeper question, a human question, a values question, which has got to be whose economy is it? Whose is it? And who, who does it work for? I mean, we mustn't let ourselves be mystified by economic language, by being told, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't have that. We have to raise the human questions. Who is it for? What is it for? And if human needs can't be met in it, then doesn't it have to be changed in very basic ways? <clears throat> now, I think we are finally, I mean, I really, I am optimistic. I want to end on an optimistic note. In a, at a point where it is politically feasible, finally, to raise these kinds of issues and really push our political representatives and, and leaders um, very, very sharply on these things. I think we can, we can not only stop the trend toward class polarization and the racial polarization in the society, but we could potentially reverse it and get back on the track towards those ideals we supposedly share as a nation, which are equality, opportunity, and social justice. And I think this is a time of opportunity because the far right has significantly discredited itself. The people that engineered Reaganomics, the people that justified it, the people that made the, the fascinating arguments for cutting all the programs for the poor have significantly discredited themselves. I won't go so far to say they're through, and we won't be hearing more for them, though my fingers are crossed. But, you know, it's, and part of this, by the way, you know, part was the stock market crash itself. There was free enterprise at work. Uh, part was the Iran-Contra um, scandal, showing us just exactly what was going on when we thought there was some democratic control over foreign policy. And part of it is what happened to the most visible parts of the Christian right. Um, the deification of selfishness and greed that they have represented while all the time Per pushing and pursuing uh, policies for the rest of us that are, you know, the very opposite of Christian. Most Americans today, when polled, in fact, the same poll is true in 1984, want to see increases in government spending on human services and decrease on, decreases on military spending. That's clear. Four out of five Americans will say that in polls. They just haven't had anybody to say that for them in a public way until, well, Jesse Jackson and those candidates who managed to catch up with him. <laughs> so I think, I feel very hopeful. We have had, we are, the whole in, the political debate is opening up in this country. I think new things are possible. This is not the time to pull back. This is the time to be involved. And I just want to end with a little pressure uh, on, on you to, to get involved to be part of this, because I think there are going to be real and exciting, dramatic changes. Um, and, but we're not going to get from here to there unless we're all part of it. So first, let me say, you know, get involved at whatever level. Citizenship is not a spectator sport. When we let it become that, we forfeit, we forfeit our claim to be a democracy. 
We have to get out there. And that may mean registering other people to vote. It may mean stimulating the debate, not just with the candidates, but amongst everybody. But it may mean joining something. I would say it's very important to join something. People who are reformers all alone sometimes just become cranks. We do much better when we support each other and work together. Uh, and, and I'm sure in Manhattan and on his college campuses there are plenty of, plenty of groups to get involved with. And then I want to say something to those of you who are college students now, um, because a lot depends on you, not just because you're younger and brasher and so on, but um, because you are being trained for success as our society defines it. And I think it's important in the, in the face of the growing division, the class division of American society that I have talked about, that we need to take a stand against success as our society defines it. <laughs> Your generation of college students is supposed to have been, well, brain dead was one of the kind things that was said not too long ago. <laughs> Posters of Ivan Bosky up in your dorm rooms, I know all about it. But that's already changing. I know that's changing. And there is a new spirit on the college campuses of saying, no, we don't want that. We want something meaningful in our lives. And something meaningful is something that connects us with other human beings through creative and social justice oriented projects. That's what, that's what we want. So I think it's very important. We need a new culture on the campuses that says, no, we don't want to be the top dogs in a deeply divided society. No, we don't want to be the best paid in a deeply militarized society. We want a place, but in a society that is heading for something more like peace and social justice for all of us. Now, these are big changes, um, big changes that I think we're going toward or have to aspire to. Um, I think what we are finally, ultimately talking about is not something that just one candidate or even one party can represent, but a change that is ultimately, well, to use words economists don't usually use, a moral change, a spiritual kind of change, a values kind of change. It's a change which will, I think, be a transformation which will come, and when it comes, I'm sure be global in its implications, because everything, everything we do in our society is global in its implications, just as we are part of that global economy today. And what we are looking for also, what we are heading towards, a change of such scope, I think it will be historical in its implications. I'm not promising utopia, but I think compared to the last eight years, we should raise our aspirations and go for it for major social change and stop going around saying, well, we can't have this, we can't have that, but say, no, we should have it, we deserve it, we need this change, and we're doing it for all Americans. It begins now, this change, no matter how big it is, and I would just finish by saying it begins now, it begins here, but most of all, it begins with us. Thank you.